hello. Today we're sitting in front of my bookshelf, so you know what that means. The month of March is rapidly approaching. By the time you see this, it is March, and I haven't done a reading review since December, so it's time. I've got my Howie plant here. For those of you who are new, hi, my name is Ali. I'm 27 years old. I moved to Belgium when I was 21 to marry my husband, and I've been here figuring out my life ever since. Just one day shy of the pandemic striking Belgium, my best friend Howie, who immigrated to Belgium with me, passed away. I bought this Monstera in his name, and it was pretty medium-sized. Now, he is as tall as I am. <laughs> Seeing as we are close to his birthday and his death day, I figured it's a good time to honor him, especially since he was such a cozy friend to read with. Speaking of books, before we dive into what I've read for the past three months, let's hear it from today's sponsor, Book of the Month. Hello, Ali from the future, here to tell you about my personal favorite subscription service on the internet.com right now. If you didn't already know, Book of the Month is a fast growing and ever popular book service for readers like me. They promote new and emerging authors to help you find books that you're bound to love. Their team works night and day, sifting through hundreds of titles to then provide us a monthly selection. I'm not good at math, but it does not take a genius to come to the conclusion that this means you can spend more time reading and less time researching what to read next. But my absolute favorite part of Book of the Month is that it's risk-free, meaning you can press pause on any month for any reason without being charged or penalized. As long as you have a US-based shipping address, you can get your first book from Book of the Month for $9.99 using the code Allison Pages. This month, there are not five, nor six, but seven different books to choose from. So let's get right into it. The Cartographers by Peng Shepard. A woman finds a strange map in her deceased dad's belongings that will send her on an adventure towards her family's dark history. The Unsinkable Greta James by Jennifer E. Smith. Following an indie musician, this pitch perfect story illustrates the way we recover love in the strangest of places. Tell Me Everything, the story of a private investigation by Erica Krauss. A female PI cracks a case of sexual assault in this story that's part memoir, part literary fiction. Dating Dr. Dill by Nisha Sharma. Can a love averse TV doctor and a hopeless romantic spark an unlikely romance? The Verifiers by Jane Pack. If you like mysteries, but also immigrant family stories, this examination of how technology shapes our romantic choices may be the selection for you. The Book of Cold Cases by Simone St. James. A true crime blogger gets more than she bargained for while interviewing the woman acquitted of two cold case slayings. And last but not least, The Paris Apartment by Lucy Foley. Everyone's a neighbor, everyone's a suspect, and everyone knows something they're not telling. What a mysterious collection to choose from this month! Let me know which book you would hypothetically choose or make your dreams come true and click the link in the description box below to get your first book from Book of the Month for $9.99 using the code Allison Pages. Let's continue on with the reading review. Thank you, Book of Love, for sponsoring this video. <gasps> Wow, wonderful. Thank you, Ellie from the future. I'm not gonna go through these in any particular order. I'm just gonna grab some and talk about them. You know how it goes. First up is Bloom by Kevin Panetta and Savannah Ganucho. This is a graphic novel that follows our protagonist, Ari, who works at his family bakery, and the love story that unfolds between the flour and the sugar with the bakery's new hire, Hector. This was just so much deeper than I expected. I thought it would be a fun, light, flirty, and sweet escape, which it was, but then it also had a really strong theme of sticking to your roots, staying true to yourself, loving what you love unapologetically, it was so precious. I loved it so much. There's a delicious streusel or muffin topping on page 95 that I have made for about four batches of muffins since I finished this book. And there's also a sourdough starter in the back, which I have yet to try. A sequel is coming out for this one, and I cannot wait until 2023. This one got five stars for me easily. It is so good. I love it so much. Next, The Astonishing Color of After by Emily XR Pan. This is a YA fiction that we read for the Pocket Pages book club. We follow our teenage protagonist who just lost her mother to suicide, but she believes that her mother lives on in a bird. Overall, I felt like this one dipped its toes into a lot of different, very important avenues, but we couldn't properly dive deep into any of them given the age demographic or the genre and what felt like to me the book trying to meet the needs of that genre. I think it could have said a whole lot more about the stigma surrounding mental health. I felt like the romance was really forced and seemed like it just had to to be in there because it was YA and I really felt like it cheapened the overall story. I personally feel like we would have benefited a lot more from this one if we had followed the mother's storyline more than the teenager's storyline or if it was adult or both. But I loved that it dabbled in trying to understand your identity when your roots are formed in a place you've never been and then visiting said place and exploring said place and learning all sorts of new things including the language. Again, dipped our toes in, wish we went deeper. And yet somehow I felt like it was too long. There were just a lot of aspects to this one that I felt could have been fleshed out more and a lot of aspects that could have been scrapped, but that's just my opinion. But I did not not like this one. I probably would have liked it a bit more if I read it when I was younger, but it got three stars for me. Next was our Pocket Pages book club for January, The Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman. This was a reread for me. As some of you may already know, this is the book that got me out of about a decade long reading slump. It completely reintroduced me to that imaginative space in my brain that I thought was lost, fully reminding me why reading is such a beautiful and powerful thing. And I really enjoyed reading this book with everybody because it really solidified why it was a favorite, because everyone's qualms with 
present, perhaps the pacing or unanswered questions and everything are completely valid and well present within this book. I completely looked past all of those things because of how magical the experience was for me personally, which is typically how favorites go. I would argue that there are no books on this earth that aren't without flaws, especially when it comes to subjective experience. And so I feel like it's the book's job to take the time that you share together and allow you to transcend any flaws it may have and take you on such a journey that you're blind to any holes that may be present. This book was that book for me. So this is a magical realism story about a little boy who makes friends with a girl down the road who seems to be a part of this magical witchy lady family dynamic. And there's not really much else I think I'm going to tell you because I went into this book not knowing anything about it and I think you should do the same. I read this for the first time in 2017 and reread it again in 2022 and it still holds for me. Still on my favorite shelf, still five stars. Next, let's just stick to the theme of the pocket pages and get through all three. <laughs> the book we read for February is Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants by Robin Wall Kimmerer. This book is so important. I was going to say to me, but I think just period. It is so important. Our author is an indigenous woman, part of the Potawatomi Nation, and she's also a biologist. And she takes her knowledge from her roots and from what she's learned through education, and she weaves them together into this beautifully woven collection of knowledge brought to us by some of the most eloquent short essays I've ever had the privilege of reading. Holy smokes. She somehow wields the power to focus the reader on such a intricate and tiny part of nature, such as strawberries or pecans, and connect it to a big flaw in the way we run our world. And not only that, but offers ways to improve it. Fuck, I just thought it was so, it's so fucking good. It's just so good. I'm a very fast reader, but this book reminded me to slow down and soak in all the details and to marinate in what it's teaching me. I could have easily finished this in a day or two because it was that good, but I didn't want to. It didn't feel right. It's just such a rich book. You need to cherish each chapter and give it the respect it deserves. I need to reread this an infinite number of times, to be honest. Not only is this my favorite book that I've read so far in 2022, but after I'm finished filming this, it's going right on my favorite shelf because it got five stars. Ugh, it was so good. I cannot recommend it enough. Next. The Holiday Swap by Maggie Knox. I read this book when I was down in the dumps around Christmas time. It was the second COVID Christmas. I haven't seen my family since 2019. And so perhaps that changed my personal experience in reading this because it was just such an easy escape and it helped me be a little festive even when I was feeling anything but. This is about two twin sisters who swap places just days before Christmas. And of course they both fall in love with somebody while in this fake identity and silliness ensues. It's lighthearted, it's simple, it's Riddled with plot holes, don't ask questions. Just have a good time. <laughs> it did what it came here to do. I gave it three stars. Next, I buddy read Sally Rooney's Beautiful World Where Are You with my booktube friend, Kirsty. As of right now, both our reading vlogs are live on youtube.com. This is my second Sally Rooney. I read Conversations with Friends about a year ago. So this book follows two friends who are semi-estranged and communicate via email. And so you bounce between both of their perspectives and what they're up to in their adult life. It comments on class and capitalism, dabbles in mental health a little bit. For the most part, I wish the anchor of the story was more heavy and solid because the boat was a fun enough time, if that makes any sense. There were so many nice little quotes in there, which were so strong and relatable and also beautifully written. But then there were also just a lot of forced and pretentious aspects as well. In the beginning, I really loved the emails and thought that if the book were just those emails, it would get five stars. But then towards the end, they just kept getting worse and worse in a sense of nobody talks to their friends in this way. Whole lot of Bronze Age talk. To me personally, there was also a lot too much, way too much sex in this book. Overall, I just wish this book had more substance for its substance. I wish there was a better foundation laid out. I wish there was more of a story to follow, but perhaps that's just not what Sally Rooney's here to do. Perhaps we're not the most compatible as reader and author, but I had to find enough time and I gave this three, 3.5 stars in the end. Next, we have Blindness by Jose Saramago. This book is from the 90s and it is about a plague of white blindness sweeping the nation. And of course the government, etc., were not prepared for such an outbreak. So they just rallied everybody who fell ill and shoved them into an abandoned mental asylum. Quite literally the blind leading the blind except one of the man's wives is somehow immune to this plague and pretends to be blind to join her husband in this lawless and chaotic space. In the end, mad props to Jose. What a creative concept. What strong ideas. For example, you don't know anybody's name. It's just the doctor, the doctor's wife, the girl with black glasses, the crying boy. But I couldn't tell if there were actual pacing problems or just the fact that there's no grammar executed in any of these pages that made it feel so dragged out. There's also a good chance 
but the translation does not do it justice. Towards the end, it really started to feel like a chore. I understand that Jose was against structures and trying to be revolutionary in his tactics of not using punctuation marks or paragraph breaks or things of the like, but there's a reason we have these things. And so it was hard to enter the flow of the story or be immersed in the story because it was such work to read it. I also hated the ending, like a lot. I was really hoping that after such an arduous process of reading all the pages of this book, at the end, it would be a reward. And I was already having a bad day that day. I just really wanted a win and it did not provide. So at the end of the day, super creative, quite strong in its themes, but really difficult to get through at the end. So this one got a 2.5 or a three for me. Next, we have Somebody's Daughter, a memoir by Ashley C. Ford. Ooh, this book was written so beautifully. I talked about this in my end of the year reading wrap up and read the section where she connects snakes burning alive to how humans stick together. And there were just so many moments like that. I've seen a few complaints online that the blurb does not accurately outline what the pages provide, which I get. The blurb does make it seem that it will be more heavily focused on her imprisoned father and their relationship. And there's not too much of that, but that didn't end up bothering me because she just had such a way with words and telling her story and nothing really ever felt too drawn out. It was all so eloquently said and poignant. I highly recommend that if you read this one to take a gander at some interviews that she has, some content that she's made online because she has a good story to tell. I've decided personally that I'm gonna stop rating memoirs, but please understand that I could not recommend this one enough. Next! Spectrum Women, Walking to the Beat of Autism, edited by Barb Cook and Dr. Michelle Garnett. This is a nonfiction, a collection of essays by autistic women outlining their own chosen vignette for their experience with autism. I thought it was pretty good, obviously, hence all of the tabs. It was very educational, it was very readable. I'm a bit torn in how to feel about this one because I felt that there were a lot of really fair critiques online. On one hand, just like the entire medical community, most research has been done on cis men, so we should be giving a voice to women's experiences. But then on the other hand, what kind of damage are we creating in the medical community? By creating a binary, we have men's experiences on a pedestal, the other experiences of women starting to get some light, but then what about non-binary experiences, trans experiences? I think that's a very fair conversation to have. Also, this didn't stick out to me while reading, but makes so much sense, was at the end of each essay, they had a doctor outline what the essay was about and giving medical terms. At first take, I appreciated the emotional subjective experience and providing medical language for said experience, but someone said that that's extremely invalidating to the person who wrote the essay. The fact that we need an assumed neurotypical doctor to give a little check mark to your essay. I don't know. The fact of the matter is people who aren't men tend to be left in the dark when it comes to autism spectrum disorder, not receiving their diagnosis until well into their adult years, right before they die or never at all. And so I suppose we can't be too picky when it comes to what's available out there, but of course we can want better. But I'm glad that I read it. I thought it was really educational. I thought it spanned a lot of great topics through the lens of autism spectrum disorder. Up next, Next, let's not hold out anymore. I DNF'd to Paradise by Hana Yanagihara. Where to begin? One of my most viewed videos on my channel is my little life reading vlog. This was when I had maybe 400 people viewing my videos and I was brand spanking new to the booktube community. Brand spanking new. A cherub. The only discourse that I had come across at the time was that a little life is hard to read, it covers hard topics, and therefore it's trauma porn. There wasn't too much circulating about the author, there wasn't too much circulating about much else. And so I felt the need to defend trauma being represented in an accurate way, despite it being painful, yada yada yada. Since then, I've read Hanya's other book, The People in the Trees. There is such a fair critique, such a fair critique, or question, that is, why does every book that Hanya Yanagahara writes feature gay men, and why are they always suffering? A Little Life and The People in the Trees feature pedophilia. Why are we always viewing homosexuality through a disgusting and illegal lens? I couldn't tell you all the trigger warnings for this book. I read 200 pages of the 800 something, and I DNF'd it because there's both too much to cover and also not much to be said at the same time. First of all, if you're not new to this page, you know how much I hate reading about rich people. And the first and the second book, we were in mansions talking about eloquent furniture this, rich grandpa that. And also I don't think that the first book really told anything new. Once again, the first story was about a sick gay man. Why? I was painfully bored, dreadfully taking notes to keep track of everything, not rooting for any of the characters, and I DNF'd it. I was so hyped believe me, it was gonna get its own reading vlog, but I was just sitting on this couch looking at all these books that I would much rather be reading. Also, why is it that we can twist history to make gay marriage legal, but racism is still alive and present? Also a very good question to ask, in my opinion, I think. I didn't finish reading it, and I'm glad I didn't finish reading it. 
Next, we have A History of Wild Places by Shea Earnshaw. Ooh, <laughs> what a tone shift. <laughs> this book was so fun and eerie and mysterious. But let's rewind. The first chapter, we're in a detective's perspective and you think it's going to be this rainy, desaturated crime novel. But then, blink, we're in the forest in a cult question mark with magic. This was such an exciting combination of so many genres. It was magical realism, mysterious with sprinkles of thriller. This was good. This was so good. This is a book that took me out of my living room and dropped me into a damp forest. I could smell the honeysuckle. I could taste the tea. I could feel the emotions. It was so good. The only reason that this one didn't get a five for me is because the twist at the end was kind of lame in my opinion, but the rest of the story made up for it. In the end, it got 4.5 for me. I really, really liked this one. Four left. Speaking of magic, we have The Tea Dragon Society by Katie O'Neill. This is such a magical place to be in. It's just about people who take care of dragons who make tea. Little dragons that grow flowers or leaves on their little cute bodies and you can make tea with them and it's magical tea and it's better than regular tea and I want one. The color palette was entrancing. The characters were adorable. The art is to die for. The only reason that this one didn't get five stars for me is because I wish it was a little bit longer but that is genuinely my own complaint. Give this one a read if it interests you at all. Next, we've got Ugly Love by Colleen Hoover. This is my third Colleen Hoover and it ended up being my least favorite but what does this woman put in her pages. How does she do this? I've seen a lot of people say, not liking romance is not a personality trait. You're not cool if you don't like romance, you just hate women. I tend to not like romance because the most popular ones tend to be heterosexual, which is fine. Heterosexual couples exist. But my issue with that is when a whole book is just about the relationship that this woman has with a man. What are her interests? Who are her friends? How else does she spend her days? I don't think it's good to only care about a man who will not communicate with you. This book is no exception. Just communicate. Use your words and communicate. There's a whole reading vlog for this where my feelings are more fleshed out. So go on over that if you want to. Two left. Up next we have Don't Cry For Me, a novel by Daniel Black. I just finished this one this morning, so bear with me as I try to process my thoughts. This book was so well written that I had to remind myself several times throughout that it was fiction. That being said, this is a fictional story. A black father makes amends with his gay son through letters written on his deathbed in this wise and penetrating novel of empathy and forgiveness. I think this did such a splendid job of depicting the black American experience while also being so accessible and relatable to most everyone. These pages really illuminated and showed what people mean when they say it was a different time. When it comes to toxic masculinity and previous parenting styles and things of the like. For example, when he said, now I see why you and your mother read so much. It makes you think, makes you see things you can't see. And that was my problem. I had all kinds of opinions, but I couldn't see a damn thing. Ooh, fuck. But my personal favorite line that I think is just so applicable, especially in the conversation around people banning books and critical race theory in school in the United States is, don't nobody live in the past, ma'am. The point of history is to tell you how to live in the future so people don't make the same mistakes over and over. Ooh, this was fucking good. This was so fucking good. Short, sweet, and to the point. Highly recommend this one. I gave it four stars. And last but not least was the book that surprised me the most, aside from DNFing, who I thought was my favorite author. And that is House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland. I'm not gonna lie. I judge books by their cover, and this cover is exquisite. I bought this book, so then when I'm bogged down by all of my school reading and everything, I could have an easy escape. It's YA fiction. It's about three witchy sisters. I thought it would just be an easy and light escape. Boy, was I wrong. The first third or so of the book really had a YA feel. The dialogue was a little cheesy. And then we just... I don't even know. This book was so much more eerie and unsettling than I had anticipated. What in the actual world is this allowed? I'm still thinking about it. The premise is three sisters went missing on New Year's Eve and then spontaneously reappeared in the same spot they disappeared, naked and all with the same scar on their neck. And now they have powers kind of and weird things keep happening. And the older sister was missing so the other two try to find her and save her and just fuckery unfolds. What in the world? I would like to give a special shout out to the character Tyler in this book for providing such a comedic relief because I needed it. Because what in the world? If you think you know where this book is going, no you do not. <laughs> That's all I can say. I read this book in 24 hours because I couldn't put it down. I gave it four stars. Give it a chance if you dare. <laughs> 
So those are the 15 books that I read over the past three months. Reading has slowed down a little bit thanks to school, but you know what? We're still reading a pretty hefty amount. And technically we only read 14 because we didn't read To Paradise. Not sorry. How has your reading been treating you in the year of 2022? Have you found a favorite book yet? Please let me know. I never get sick of recommendations. And as always, thank you for clicking, thank you for caring, and thank you for being nice. Thank you for all the people on Patreon who make all of this possible. Thank you Book of the Month for sponsoring this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!